and welcome back to coverage here of the Neon Dynasty Championship. Marshall Sutcliffe with Tim Phillips, and we're looking at some round five action for you here. We've transitioned over to Historic, as we noted there in the last round, and Cedric, we're going to get a really good taste of what the players have brought here this, this round, because we've got the number one archetype and the number two archetype represented in the feature match area. We've got Shoti Asoka playing that second archetype, which is Azorius Control, and that is Greg Orange on is it Phoenix, which was the number one most represented archetype. Gotta say, I'm a little surprised that Greg Orange is not, you know, doing the Azorius control things. He, he loves a control deck more than almost anybody. To see Shota playing this deck, not that surprising. He also loves a control deck, but Greg I don't a understand little aggressive. It. Yeah. I don't understand it. I'm I... a little taken aback. Because we've seen over Greg's career that he will force the issue. Like, yes. even in formats where it's like control isn't the thing. In fact, honestly, that's true for both of these players. Yep. <laughs> uh, but but Greg definitely prefers to play blue-based control decks whenever possible and uh, must have found himself in the spot where he just didn't find a good list that he liked or, you know, maybe focused on alchemy more or whatever and said, I'm just going to play Phoenix. It's the best deck. And that's what he's got here. Like I said, I like you. I am I am also surprised. But uh, I would say here, quality hands for both players. These hands that you're going to see for Izzet Phoenix, they all look pretty much the same, right? You're going to see some cantrips, be it Faithless Looting, Opter, Consider, the incredibly powerful expressive iteration, goals to get Phoenixes into the graveyard, or uh, if you're playing Ox of Agonis, that's where it would like to be too. And then get those birds back. Uh, and I would say that Azorius Control is not trying to stop it because it's a very hard thing to stop. I'm saying they're trying to answer it once it actually does happen. A okay, couple of lands here for Greg. Of course, one of the big challenges with the deck is that you need to find a way to get the Arclight Phoenixes in the yard. Now, he's got that already with Faithless Looting, but you also have to make sure that you conserve your spells <laughs> so you can cast that third spell that one turn and pop them right back into play straight away. So you, you'll see that they don't often just fire off everything they can whenever. They'll kind of you know be a little cagey about when they're going to cast these spells to make sure they have enough. Like you see, he just left opt in hand this time, for example. Yeah, instead of casting an opt on the end of turn, like many would do with a card like that, instead he's going to save that, kick things off the Faithless Looting to attempt to put a Arclight Phoenix to the graveyard. But you're going to see a main deck copy here of Dovin's Veto from Yasoka, who's going to stop this from happening. Shona yeah, this week is playing, he's playing two main deck copies of that card, and that's the kind of card that, depending on the metagame, you're going to want to start or you're going to want to have it come off the bench. And clearly, Shota feels like it's good enough to start here with multiple copies in the main. Yeah, and he's right. You know, if he's going to be facing down Phoenix decks all weekend, he's going to want, to, he's going to want those whenever possible. When we here, think it's super of... tough uh, for, for Greg. He just uh, isn't really able to get anything going without that. He doesn't have any way to get these things in the yard. And wow, another veto here. Shota saying no. No, yeah, th those are those are cards that are worth stopping right now, and Greg is kind of floundering. Now, fortunately for Greg, he does have a copy of Mystical Dispute, and talking about a card that is sometimes main deckable, sometimes not, depending on the metagame, it's going to be a real good one right now, Marshall. Jeez, that is a beat down. One man at a counter to and That's an insane, an insane draw step from Greg, too, picking up a Faithless Looting. Wow, that could really open up the floodgates for him here, though finding an extra Phoenix would have been ideal. He did not manage to do so. But he does get to discard two creatures that you don't mind having in your graveyard, one Ox of Agonis and one Arclight Phoenix. Gets to follow up with Dragon's Rage Channeler and now Opt, which he'll also get a surveil off of. He's going to put that in the yard. Looking for one more cantrip on Holy Heat already has in his hand, so there's other ways to do it. Yeah, now this kind of stinks, right? Because he was looking yes. for a consider, a looting. You don't really want to Holy Heat your own creature to get back a single Phoenix, so moving on. Yep, that's a tough beat for him because now he's going to have to lean on those other copies of Faithless Looting, but that's a much slower process for him. When you're flashing back eluding, it can be difficult to, to get two more spells going in the same turn. Here's Portable Hold to take down the Dragon's Rage Channeler. And boy, you can see that Yasoka has come prepared for the matchup. He seems to have had an answer for everything that Greg has done so far. Yeah, again, he can answer plenty of things. I think inevitably a Phoenix will come back. You know, Greg will be able to get creatures on the battlefield at some point, as you saw a Sprite Dragon get drawn here. Uh, again, to me, it's more about just Kinshota kind of answer everything and then eventually take over with a Planeswalker. 
which is what he was trying to do with resolving that to fairy. It just got hit by a mystical dispute. The one mystical dispute, by the way. Of course it's a one of. Yeah. And that's why he saw it, showed to just play it out. He's like, okay, you might have it, but I'm going to make you have it. Mm -hmm. There's March of Otherworldly Light, a card that we've seen had a drum, have a dramatic impact in both formats here this weekend. March uh, really is a great answer for a lot of what's going on here in Historic. Come on, Shota, let's do this, buddy. Yeah, I knew. I, I was just going to let you Come have on, it. Come buddy. Let's really. just do this. Let's do that thing. He draws Shark Typhoon. <laughs> now he can just fire it off here and make a 3-3 Shark. That's probably the adult responsible thing to do, but... You know what I'm thinking? I mean, they don't run very many counters here in Greg's deck. You know, you, you can't you can't get away with running too many counter spells in a Phoenix deck. And uh, <laughs> I'm kind of liking the idea of playing an enchantment against a blue red deck with not that many counter spells. So we're gonna get a third spell here, Marshall. We saw consider an iteration into Faithless Looting on the flashback. No Phoenix is there, but plenty of cards to discard. Uh, and so there should be a Phoenix, I think, in the graveyard. Yeah, there's one in there. there but Shota's really bought himself a lot of time here, right? I mean, this, he's got another March of Otherworldly like, come on, do it. Shota, the shields are down, nothing bad can happen. I mean, you say that, but I actually agree with you. I don't really think there's a lot bad that can happen. Yeah. I think that casting this is not really out of the question here. Doing it, yeah, yes. baby. That's the yes. one. Let's, Let's get this go. thing kicked off right with a shark typhoon on the battlefield. Now he's in a bit of a pickle here. He doesn't have any more spells to cast. But come on, heart of the cards, right? You got to have a little faith in your library to uh, provide you with some some action. He's also got a cycling land here too. So yeah, you got an irrigated farmland in your hand. You can cycle <laughs> that to turn into anything, even another shark typhoon. Oh. This is beautiful. This is beautiful. <laughs> Oh, I love every second of this. These are good top decks here from Greg as well, though. You can see crackling Drake in hand as well as that Stormwing Entity he drew for the turn. He has one Unholy Heat that at least theoretically can take care of a shark. But the top of uh, Shota's library could be fire here, depending on what he draws. Cards like Teferi are top of the list for him right now. You see a Stormwing Entity is going to come down here. ETB Scry 2. Uh, actually, the reason this card is actually kind of included in this deck is there's... Oops. Sorry sorry about Rip. that, Whammy. Rip. <laughs> <laughs> that is a nice draw step and rest in peace. Can't I was going to focus... Order. I was going to focus on Stormwing Entity and its high casting cost actually being an important part of this tournament. Uh, but rest in peace is going to generate a 2-2 shark and more importantly say goodbye, Faithless Lootings. Goodbye, Ox Vagonis. It's on you now, Crackling Drake, to get the job done. Yeah, and these blue-red decks, they have a hard time dealing with uh, resolved enchantments. Not really the name of the game for that color pair. Usually the most they can do is bounce them uh, temporarily. As it stands, though, Greg has crafted a fairly threat-dense hand here. He's got double Arclight Phoenix and Crackling Drake, and yes, he'll have to do it the, the good old-fashioned way and just cast them, which is certainly not where you really want to be. But hey, there's a land off the top for Shota. Yeah, I mean, I think Shota might just be dead here because he bricked off on his draw and Crackling Drake is a 13. On Holy Heat's going to kill the Shark Token and make Crackling Drake a 14. And oh. look, my math isn't great all the time, but uh, 14 plus 3 is still 17. Yeah, I wonder if Shota was still supposed is. to castle Vantress there. Yeah, that's kind of my question too, is was there, you know, were you supposed to upkeep Vantress? I'm not really sure what you're trying to hit, but uh, he's going to take a whole bunch of damage. So that Rest in Peace was timely, but no real great follow-up. Yeah, it looks like he's going to take all of the damage here as that Crackling Drake is insane. Uh-oh, Marshall, we got some hardcast haters in Twitch chat now. Now, apparently, hardcasting the Shark Typhoon was wrong. Oh, oh they're apparently. saying it was wrong now. Yeah, oh, apparently. Okay. All right, so that's game number one, going to Greg Orange, who gives a little shrug, like, all right. <laughs> I, I, I guess I'll take it, he says. As uh, he probably felt like that one was going to come unraveling on him there after those two critical enchantments hit the battlefield. But uh, as it stood, Shota missed a couple of uh, key draw steps there hitting lands. And Greg did a really good job of kind of filtering through his library and leaving himself with those type of outs. I mean, that Crackling Drake was absolutely massive. It ended up being 16 power on its own. And what I kind of mentioned during the early stages of that game did come to fruition. And so far as... 
look, Greg's going to be able to execute his game plan, right? We saw Dovin's Veto counter two cantripping spells. I think it was a Faithless Looting and Expressive Iteration. But Greg was still able to, again, execute his game plan because his deck is very consistent. He's going to find copies of Faithless Looting. He's going to find copies of Opt and Consider and Expressive Iteration. And those aren't really worth fighting over in most instances. The thing that was backbreaking there for Shota was that Mystical Dispute on the Teferi, which was realistically Shota's best chance to win that game, and that was taken care of. Things are going to change a little bit after sideboard. You see a lot of cards coming in here in Aether Gust, Mystical Dispute, Baneslayer Angel, additional copy of Rest in Peace, so on and so forth. Going to get away from some of these more expensive cards like Teferi or Counter Magic esque cards like Archmage's Charm and Dovin's Veto. So, going to shake it up quite a bit here as Shoda. Both of these players are 4 and 0 coming into the round. It's getting to be exclusive company here on the undefeated side of things. Greg's ready to go. Showed up normally blazing fast at all aspects of the game, including sideboarding, taking just a little extra beat here to make sure it looks right. Yeah, this is kind of slow for the Hall of Famer. I, you know, I'm thinking of when he won Pro Tour Kaladesh, which was, you know, I don't know if it was 10 years ago now or not, but, you know, a handful of years ago, because, uh, you know, time is a hard thing to keep track of. But uh, regardless, you know, he, man, did he play fast during that tournament with that control deck. Yes. With that Jeskai deck that he won with, because he plays control decks so, so fast. So yeah. fast. I, I think Kaladesh was probably actually six years ago, not Six 10. years ago, yeah, it's 2016. Yeah. 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 yeah, I'm dating myself a little bit here. Yeah, you're clearly very old, so. Baby, 36 is, uh, I'm getting up there, okay? <laughs> you're only 36? Yeah. <laughs> 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 uh. <laughs> All right, I let's feel, get underway I, here. I feel old, man. Not good I for feel me. Old. All right. Not good for me. All right, there's a rest in peace once again. This one's going to start things off. And, uh, yeah, that thing's just going to sit there on the battlefield kind of doing its thing. The good news uh, for Greg is that he's able to make at least some adjustments. What just happened there? What I miss? Yeah. He, I something? Well, I don't know why that Sprite Dragon... I guess he... Did he play the wrong land, perhaps? Mm, maybe. I don't this know what I missed there, but it looked like he had a Sprite Dragon lined up for two and then didn't do it. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I, uh, I yeah, wrong land. There, but wrong land. I think he just played the... I think maybe he was supposed to play the Pathway and he played the Coast instead and it ETB tapped and he got a little ouchied on that one. Got caught, There's yeah. Faithless Looting. Looks a lot worse with the rest in peace out there. Not only do the cards in the graveyard don't do anything anymore because they get exiled, but also it gets exiled so you don't get to flash it back. Really tough having a rest in peace on turn two for this deck. It does shut off a lot of what it's trying to do. Yeah, you know, it makes it makes a lot of cards worse. Like you mentioned, we talk about Faithless Looting, Arclight Phoenix, of course. Those are the easy ones. But even a card like Dragon's Rage Chandler is going to get significantly worse because it'll never get to go in the 3-3 mode. Looks like Vito going to take care of that Ooh. expressive iteration there, too. The big Dovin's Vito as well, because that's one of the kind of fair ways that Greg has to, to get back ahead on cards. And there it is, Baneslayer Angel. Let's go back to 2010, <laughs> get a little VSA on the battlefield. Yeah, so I'm into this game plan that Shota has after sideboard, which is, okay, enough of this answering all your stuff crap. I'm just going to kill you, mm. and you're just going to have a real problem with that. So... Baneslayer Angel is one, Lyra is another, and it's not often that Lyra's, you know, subtext comes up into a game to work alongside another Angel, uh, but we're going to be seeing that here in just a little bit. Love it. Blue-white mid-range, you know? Sure. Like, if you can play a Rest in Peace, you your blue-white mid-range deck will quite easily handle, you know, uh, the fair version of Is It Phoenix, right? Yeah, oh, now, that's a lot yeah. to ask. Everything has to, you have to have all the pieces and stuff, but... This Baneslayer Angel is a major problem here for Greg, as it's going to take minimum two cards to deal with it, as he's never going to have Delirium. So it's going to have to be, you know, combinations of cards. Sure, he can brazen and borrow it for a minute, but it's just going to come back. And this is the type of card that if it gets to attack even once, uh, the game ends very quickly, given the uh, lifelink on it. There you go, a Crackling Drake. Yeah, Crackling Drake is the kind of card that can maybe get Greg back into this game, but again, Shona's turns are very, very simple, which is, oh, you bounce my, uh, you bounce my angel? Okay, well, I'm gonna cast it again. You're gonna have to try to beat this thing. Yeah, and, I, and I, it's gonna be extraordinarily difficult to get through both Baneslayer and Lyra Dawnbringer there. 
Crackling Drake just runs into both of them and dies. And uh, Shota can just have, have them on the battlefield. He can even just start turning them sideways. Crackling Drake, of course, a little bit resilient to rest in peace as it does count cards in exile, uh, as well as the graveyard. But look at this, Baneslayer Angel's in. You know how during sideboarding you were talking about Oshoto was sideboarding a little slowly, maybe playing a little slower than normal. But well, we're back to normal now. Yeah. <laughs> Just draw this. Draw, play the other one. Your turn. Yes, back to full speed here for Shota. And uh, you know, interestingly, Greg is in the in the business here of trying to get as much toughness on the battlefield as possible, and that is not what his deck does. No really doesn't he just has to pass a turn back first strike enough to do it <laughs> look at Shota just snapping off the attack here down to three goes Greg Orange and uh this game looks like it's just about in the books and you saw a very quick attack there for 11 life linking first striking damage and yeah this is uh this is more a more ideal draw here for Shota who you have to imagine coming into this tournament as we're all tied up now one to one you have to imagine Marshall spent a lot of time trying to prepare to beat is it phoenix because much like the alchemy portion of the event where people knew that runes was going to be a heavily played deck everybody knows coming to this event that is it phoenix is going to be a heavily played deck you don't know how much but you know it's going to show up it ended up showing up in big numbers 24.5 yeah. percent of the field uh registered phoenix for this and just to put that into perspective the number two deck is Azorius Control, which is what Shota's running. That was only 9.2% of the field. So, you know, when you look at any deck with an individual slice of the pie, is it Phoenix is easily the biggest by over double. And Azorius Control, much like is it Phoenix, has a pedigree in this historic format. You think of the Zendikar Rising Championship way back in December 2020 that Brad Barclay won. Now, format was way different. You know, we're talking about Euros and a bunch of other stuff going on then, but it still remains the same that Azorius Control does have a pedigree of what it needs to look like to get the job done. There's a million different ways you can build this deck, depending on what creatures you want to play, like Shark Typhoon or Hullrick or Horror, what spells you want to play, which Planeswalkers you want to play. You can really mix it up with how you build this deck, but one thing remains the same, which is it's just pretty darn good. All right, let's see if this sideboard plan now from Shota can finish the job he lost what was a pretty close game one where he was teetering on the edge of taking over but ultimately just got attacked down by greg orange kind of the good old-fashioned way but that game two was not close shoti asoka no. with the rest in peace on turn two and then angel bounced it angel into another angel and it was gg let's see if that's what's going to happen again here it's a little tough to be on Greg's side of the table, right? I, he just doesn't really have the option to bring in a whole bunch of counter spells if he's going to keep the Phoenix package in. And uh, you now that's just sort of the way that this deck is built. And it means that cards like this, rest in peace, just get to go on the stack here on turn two. And they're going to hit the battlefield and they're going to stay there. Yep. And the hope, if you're Greg, is that rest in peace isn't, play, isn't being played, excuse me, in heavy numbers here this weekend. Or if it is being played, that your opponent doesn't ever find it. And in this second and third game, Greg's had to face down rest in peace on turn two, which is a huge problem. That's right. And, you know, it's also worth noting, by the way, for people thinking that, you know, Shota's like just ripping his sideboard or whatever. It's not true. He has two in the main deck, right? Mm -hmm. And he has one extra rest in peace in the board. So, you know, he's skewed in this direction already. And yes, he gets to bolster it about out of the board, but he's ready for this matchup, no doubt about it. Yeah, and again, as I mentioned, as he should be, I think everybody should be in some respect because this deck is so darn good and popular. And is it Phoenix? I don't think it's the overwhelming most powerful deck, but when you're preparing for two formats that are very different in alchemy and historic, it's easy to shortcut a little bit and say, you know what? At least I know is it Phoenix is good enough mm -hmm. that I can play this deck. And I think a lot of players may have understandably so gone this direction. Yeah, you know, I think that, you know, when you have a split format tournament, you have to decide, right? Like, what, where am I going to put more of my energy? Splitting it right down the middle sometimes doesn't make sense. And, you know, while Historic has a few changes, uh, it's relatively stable as a metagame where Alchemy is a wide open new world. And it's also there's more rounds of Alchemy, Alchemy being played over the course of the total tournament. So it would make sense to focus your energy there. And if you're going to kind of just go, you know, just what's good in Historic, it, it's it's this. I mean, this is this is the deck that you just can say, I know it's good, it's consistent, it's powerful. 
and uh, and I can I can play it. Interesting draw step here for Greg. He picked up a copy of Crackling Drake. You saw him hovering over the den of the Bugbear Marshal, and I think he was thinking, yeah, I'm obviously just going to queue this bad boy up and kill the Wandering Emperor. But the Crackling Drake maybe gave a slight pause on, mm. are you sure you want to do that? Now, at the end of the day, as we see, Den of the Bugbear plus the token will take care of the Wandering Emperor, but something to briefly think about there. I also see life total, you know, getting down to 11. Yeah, yep. You know, this is a... It, this deck, again, isn't really great at burning you out. But, yeah, you know, it's something to keep in mind. We haven't seen Baneslayer Angel hit the battlefield just yet. And that's the kind of thing that can really change things around. This is a brutal turn here for Greg because he's trying... He has the ability, excuse me, to cast two spells this turn, right? He can play Expressive Iteration and kick his turn off that way. Dovin's Veto took care of that. He says, okay, well... I'll probably get to resolve Crackling Drake, right? I'll get to resolve one of these spells. And it's like, actually, you get to resolve nothing. You get to attack me for just one point of damage. And now if that fifth land comes rolling off the top, which oh. fortunately for Greg, it didn't, the angel would have caused a serious problem. I think Greg's game plan here, and he might not even know this, is, you know, you got to just attack and hope that, uh, hope that a fifth land never comes. Ooh, mystical disputes, interesting. Yeah, that could that could actually matter. It, it, it's a little tough because Gray kind of gets put in this awkward position where he has to decide between leaving that up or casting another threat, like Svialune of Sea and Sky here, which is just mm -hmm. kind of a generically good threat. Looks like no attack here from the Goblin. And uh, Greg <coughs> appropriately recognizing that Shark Typhoon is a possibility. And there's the fifth land. Yeah, but is are it we time for are, Baneslayer Angel? Yeah, are, are we shoving on this angel like we saw Shota do previously, which was fifth land, bang, here it comes. Instead, we're just going to see him do something we don't oftentimes see, which is slow down. He's really going to go into thinking mode, perhaps checking the lists. But with the uh, Mystical Dispute currently turned off, mm -hmm. it does seem like the way is clear. There's a negate in the board for Is It Phoenix, but that doesn't do anything Ooh. here. Ooh, Otawara Soaring City. That could be interesting. That's the nuts. Send it, send it back. Dude, that's the nuts because it only costs three because there's a legend on the battlefield. That's oh, yeah. the nuts. Wow, now the Mystical Dispute is active. Huh. What have we here? There's two five mana angels. If one of them gets countered, though, we're so, we're talking about life support here for Shota. Uh -huh. Den of the uh -huh. Bugbear comes in for damage, trade it off. Another, that's five, you're at two. Oh, <laughs> this is going to get really interesting. So last turn. Does, does he need to take a turn here? Yeah, so last time we saw Shota think before just casting the Bane Slayer, right? Greg only mm -hmm. had two mana up as opposed to three. Okay. We're also looking at a deck here. You see Greg's face in the bottom of that corner. Pretty good right now. I'm really loving this. Uh -huh. But the last turn, you know, Greg didn't have the opportunity to cast Mystical Dispute. He does now. Shota obviously has access to deck list, and now it's, okay, I'm not going to play an angel. Go ahead. Love it. Now Greg has to kind of plan out his turn here. And we're going to see Fateful Absence okay. take out the legendary threat. So my assumption right now is that Shoda has him pegged from his skill dispute. Yes. I think he would have cast an angel... Or, you know, he wouldn't play a turn in which something can Absolutely. get disputed, right? So Fateful Absence is a perfect card to kind of bridge the gap of, okay, you, you have a dispute? Great. Well, you can't counter this one. Okay. Um, and where does the game go from here? Because you also have this 2-2 shark that's really just kind of a, a stopper right now. Yeah. And this is really good news for Shoti Asoka because, yes, he's still in a little bit of a pickle trying to resolve these angels. But the great news for him is is that he gets a turn off and Greg has no forward momentum here. He's got 
a couple of counter spells, but he's not ahead on board and he has a clue that he can crack, uh, you know, if he doesn't need to spend all of his mana. Mystery card in hand right now for Greg, besides the mystical dispute, is a negate. It's a negate, so, yeah. Yeah, so maybe a little surprising to not see negate get involved there. This exchange does not come as much of a surprise. And I think if you're showing to the thought process here might be, look, I got to get this part of the game over with. This is something I like to say a lot, which is, fine, let's make this exchange. It's not favorable for me, but I can't sit here and do nothing. So, right. sure, dispute my angel, whatever. We're over that part of the game. And he has another angel to follow up with, and he's got to hope that that's good enough. Yeah, and that does seem to be his plan. And let's find out if that's the case, because Greg's going to crack this clue, find a land. He's got negate and this top deck of faithless looting. Okay, that could find him something. Yeah, that's not a bad draw. He has at least one card to throw away there in the steam vents. Yeah, so and he really I, needed a spell to put on the stack to get this Sprite Dragon bigger than the Shark, too. Yep, so I like that. And yeah, this has gotten actually significantly better. I think you can toss away DRC and Iteration, keep the Negate, or excuse me, toss away DRC and the steam vents, mm -hmm. keep the Iteration and the Negate. You have one, two, three, four, five, six mana, which means that you can Iterate. You haven't played a land yet for the turn, so I think you should have the ability to Iterate and then activate Den of the Bugbear if you want to. But it depends on what you find with iteration, which will also give Sprite Dragon another counter. There is the possibility mm -hmm. for Greg to win the game this turn, depending on what he finds. Because if he can clear out the um, the shark token, the Sprite Dragon plus the flyer might just be enough. That's right. It's five damage as it stands, and Shota's sitting helpless, staring now. <laughs> like, if he can go another thing... Another thing plus one of those things is a removal spell. Yeah, I think I think Greg's got it right. So Sprite Dragon is a four plus one is five. You play another spell, that's six. Stomp from Bone Crusher Giant kills the two two. That's seven. It tears on Holy on Heat. Holy heat yeah, right those there? will all do it. Those will all get the job done. Wow, Greg is gonna find a win right here and right now. Shota doesn't have enough time to deploy that superior sideboard plan with those angels, and he's taking lethal greg orange gets by shota yasoka and he looks surprised about it said he kind of gave a look like okay i'll take it he's gonna improve to 5-0